Not the usual beginning of one of my sermons. But does anyone doubt she believes what she is singing? I certainly don't. That was Mahalia Jackson singing with the Duke Ellington band in about 1954. At the early service, we got to play the whole song, which is wonderful. And if you go on to our website this week, you'll see the clip of the whole thing along with my sermon. Apparently, if we play more than 30 seconds, Facebook or someone shuts us off from live streaming. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is ready for use for the kingdom of God. The scripture is the basis for the very old African-American spiritual you just heard. It is a song of looking forward and hope. It's an exhortation to keep steady and hold on while you do. It characterized Jesus' insistence on looking forward and to following him no matter how hard or how hopeless things might be. It is sung by people first who knew both slavery and the plow. And Paul writes, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Well, over the decades, the song has been often reshaped to speak for other impassioned struggles and causes always exhorting that forward-facing endurance for staying the course as one tries to discern and walk Jesus' way. It's actually where the Keep Your Eye on the Prize song came from. It started there and kept getting adopted and massaged. Jesus' hand to the plow image is lasting. It's much loved. And the meaning took on life for me personally when I actually tried to do this in a field in Haiti once. Now, the song, it's not in scripture, the song adds, hold on, repeatedly, hold on, and aptly so. Those wooden handles in your hands are hard. Just imagine holding them. These are not ergonomic, trust me. <laughs> you are trying to hold on, hold them up, hold steady so the plow goes straight, guide and hold it in good tension with the animal or two pulling it i assure you hold on is necessary and powerful encouragement jesus sounds a little abrupt here in dismissing these offers from several would-be followers he explains maybe summarizes is a better word that one cannot put hand to plow and also look back. You cannot do both. If you look back while holding plow handles, literally, it'll turn over and they're heavy. Or you'll plow a crooked furrow. There's no reverse gear on them or on the animals. And sometimes if you turn to look back, you notice your hands turn too. It can flip from your hands and injure you pretty easily. I remember myself trying to look back to crane my neck to see if my row was anywhere near straight. And uh, no, it wasn't. Not at all. But turning back to look made it way worse. Going forward requires that you pay attention to what you're doing, to where you're going, who you are choosing to follow. I think it pairs well with Paul's message in his letter to the Galatians today. He's asking, what will you be led by? Desires of the body, or translated also as materiality, or by the spirit? I do think Paul overstates how stringently that what the body desires and what the spirit desires are entirely opposed to each other. That might be a little projection on his part. 
Our bodies are also part of God's creation. So how can it be so at odds with the spirit of God? Nonetheless, Paul provides a robust list of things not to do as they lead us away from God. A few lines later, he follows with a list he calls the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, self-control. Paul's two lists remind me that choosing to act from that second list, we rarely, if ever, do something we'll regret. We discern which is the action of love, which is the action of a person of faithfulness, peace. Being Episcopalians means we use our God-given capabilities to determine which one to choose. I'm not going to tell you. Nor is our bishop or anyone else. This is what we have to puzzle out and think for ourselves. Which do we choose? Based on understanding and looking at the situation and asking, all right, which is the path of patience, kindness, generosity, and so on. And we remember and enjoy the sturdiness of that three-legged stool of Anglicanism, scripture, tradition, and reason to guide us. Choosing between these two lists is just about constant in our lives, isn't it? How many of you thought twice about coming to church this morning and maybe going out walking or hiking? Staying in the air-conditioned room? I want to believe that those who say choosing something repeatedly reinforces it so that it gets easier, at least on the personal level. Whether it's the kingdom of God or the temptations around us, it would be true. Living our choices alongside with the rest of the world is even more challenging. And it has always been so why Paul's writing the letter. For us, this past week exemplified the struggle as we saw decisions made at a national and a state level which complicate or impair the choices we can make. And as the old spiritual says, we have to keep our hand to the plow, look forward, and like the Galatians, seek the kingdom of God. How we love our neighbor as ourselves means responding to that world around us. When they choose from either list, we bring our spirit, our faith. It means responding to the world as faithfully and courageously and lovingly as we can. Even Paul will say, this is not easy. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit, he says. The Galatians were Gentile, not Jewish, in that newly forming church, and they eagerly embraced the faith journey they had begun. And taking those new steps of faith had great appeal. They wanted to make that commitment more solid. Paul is responding to this, to what he has been hearing about the community, that some have come and they're trying to teach that their identity in this new faith lies in things like being circumcised or adapting Jewish dietary laws or the like. Can you imagine the confusion the arguments, feeling torn between being willing to take tangible steps to show their commitment to their new faith, and then on the other hand, this teaching from Paul, that life in the spirit is transformation within. The spirit is making us and them a new creation. People who are becoming more generous, more kind, more gentle, loving, peaceful. 
and none of these rely on circumcision or dietary laws. The tangible signs are in how we treat each other, bear each other's burdens, count the stranger as a child of God instead of an enemy. Whether it is new or long-standing faith, it is grown and revealed and shared by loving our neighbor as ourselves. We join Jesus on this faith journey, and as he sets his face to Jerusalem and goes to the cross, we see before us his way of love. And so our job is to continue looking ahead. Keep your hand to the plow and don't look back. Hold on. Amen. <laughs>